Lesson 5 for April 28 to May 4, ready for teaching on May 5, Christ in the Heavenly Sanctuary. Sabbath afternoon, May 28. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to a very important part of Scripture this week. We're going to be looking at the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're going to be studying about the sanctuary, about the heavenly sanctuary. But most of all, we're studying about our Jesus and what he has and does for us. Bless us now as we open your word. May your Holy Spirit guide us in our study and in our personal lives this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Let's read that again. Philippians 2, 9 and 10. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Talking about Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary, the book of Hebrews says in chapter 6 verse 20, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Scripture, especially the New Testament, is so clear about Christ's role as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, a role that he took after he completed his work as our sacrifice here on earth, as we read in Hebrews 10 verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. This week, we will explore the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. His intercessory work is crucial to the preparation of his people to be ready for the end time. So, We have been given this crucial admonition in The Great Controversy, page 488. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. End of quote. What is Christ doing for us in the heavenly sanctuary, and why is it so important for us to understand it, especially in the last days? Sunday, April 29, Supreme Sacrifice Studying the supreme sacrifice of Christ does so much to prepare believers for the end time. Often, humans look to the goal ahead of them, and that makes sense. But it is also good to realise that the goal is behind them. We speak of Calvary. The goal reached here by Jesus for us is irreversible and final and it gives certainty to the goal ahead as well. Question. Read Romans chapter 8, verse 3, 1 Timothy 1, 17 and 6, 16, and 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty three. Why did God send his Son into the world? Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh... God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin... He condemned sin in the flesh. And 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. And that reads, Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. And 1 Timothy 6, 16. Who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. And 1 Corinthians 15.53 For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 
God sent Christ to be a sin offering in order to condemn sin in the flesh. What does this mean? As an immortal being, Christ could not die. Therefore, the Lord became a human, taking our mortality upon himself so that he could die as our substitute. Although divine, and although in nature God, Jesus took on human likeness, and he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on the cross, as we read in Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. In a way known only to God, the divinity of Christ did not die when Jesus died on the cross. In some way beyond human comprehension, the divinity of Jesus was quiescent during the nine months in the womb and in the days in the tomb, and Jesus never used it to aid his humanity during his life and ministry here. Question Read Luke chapter 9 and verse 22. What does this tell us about the intentionality of Christ's death? Luke 9 verse 22 Saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Christ was born to die. We can imagine that there was never a moment in eternity when he was free from thoughts of the mocking, the flogging and the heartbreaking crucifixion that he would face. This is unparalleled love, never witnessed before and not fully understood. So to finish today, what can we humans do in the face of this kind of love but fall down and worship in faith and obedience? What does the reality of the cross tell us about the worthlessness of human merit? Monday, April 30. The Lamb of God Question. Read John 1, 29, Revelation 5, 12 and Revelation 13, 8. What is the one image that these texts have in common and what is the importance of that image in helping us to understand the plan of salvation? John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Revelation 5 and verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. And Revelation 13 verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship Him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. When John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God, he was making an unmistakable reference to the sanctuary. Even more directly, he was making a reference to Christ's death for sin as the one and only fulfilment of all the lambs and every other sacrificial animal in the Hebrew sanctuary ritual that had ever been slain as a sacrifice for sin. Indeed, the four Gospels whatever else they teach, ultimately tell the story of what Jesus did in his role as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But the story of Jesus and his work for our salvation does not end in the Gospels, even with his death and resurrection. From the beginning, the book of Hebrews touches on the theme of Christ as the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary after his work as the sacrificial Lamb. 
From the first mention of him in this role after the cross, in Hebrews 1.3, succeeding chapters in the book make reference to Jesus as high priest. Hebrews 1.3 reads, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The depiction of his work in the heavenly sanctuary is developed fully in detail in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through to 28. Question. Read Hebrews 7, verses 1 through to 28. What is the author saying here about Jesus? Hebrews 7, beginning at verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest, continually. Now, consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils, and indeed those who are of the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest, who has come, not according to the law of fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life, for he testifies, You are a priest for ever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope, through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest for ever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests, because they were prevented by death from continuing, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the Son who has been perfected for ever. Although these verses are so deep, so rich, 
The essence of what they are saying is that Jesus Christ has a better priesthood than did the priests before the time of Aaron in the early sanctuary service. But now, instead of an earthly priesthood in an earthly sanctuary, we have a heavenly high priest ministering for us in the sanctuary in heaven. So, when we focus our eyes on Jesus, we can focus them on him as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Tuesday, May 1, Our High Priest Question. Read Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, and Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. What great hope do these texts give to us? Hebrews 7, verse 24. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once, for all, when he offered up himself. And Hebrews 8 verse 6, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Christ is able to save completely because of several qualifications that no other priest could ever have. He is God, who has authority to forgive sins. He has a permanent priesthood. During the Christian era, he is interceding all the time for his people with the same loving compassion as when he healed the sick and comforted the lonely on earth. He is also human, but was born sinless and remained that way. And as the sinless one, he died under the staggering weight of a sum total of human sin. Only he then, as the God-man, can intercede for sinners in heaven's sanctuary. What these texts show, too, is that Christ's sacrifice was once and for all. It needed to happen only one time, and it was sufficient to bring salvation to every human being. After all, considering who it was who died on the cross, how could such an offering not be sufficient for every human being? Question. Read Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through to 15. What has Christ obtained for us through his death and now his ministry in heaven? Hebrews 9, verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9.12 says that Christ has obtained eternal redemption. The Greek word translated as redemption also means ransoming, releasing and deliverance. It's the same word used in Luke 1.68 when Zacharias declares that God has visited and redeemed his people. The reference to Christ's blood, the blood of the only sufficient sacrifice, means that it was Christ as the sacrificial lamb who obtained this redemption, this deliverance. And the great news of the gospel is that Christ obtained this not for himself but for us. 
and it becomes efficacious for all who accept Christ's sacrifice for them. And so to finish today, dwell on the idea that Christ has obtained eternal redemption for us, and that only after he accomplished this did he enter into his work in the heavenly sanctuary on our behalf. What hope does this offer us regarding what Christ is doing for us in the heavenly sanctuary? Wednesday, May 2, Our Intercessor Although sin brought a fearful separation between God and humanity, through Christ's sacrificial death, we as human beings are brought to God and can continue to have access to Him, as we read in Ephesians 2.18. For through Him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. And 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 19 and 20 reads, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, according to these verses, what has Jesus done for us? Question, read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. What does this text say that Christ's work includes? For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus is the forerunner, having entered as our representative into the heavenly sanctuary, even into the very presence of God for us. That is, Jesus is standing before the Father, ministering the merits of his atonement, the eternal redemption that he obtained in our behalf. Yes, when we accepted Jesus, our sins were forgiven, and we stood before God pardoned and cleansed. But the fact remains that even though we have become Christians, we at times still sin, despite all the wonderful promises of victory. In such cases, Jesus intercedes as our High Priest in heaven. He represents the repenting sinner, not pleading our merits, for we have none, but pleading his own on our behalf before the Father. As it says in Hebrews 7.25, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And so to finish today, What born-again Christian does not sense his or her own need of Christ's continuing mercy and grace? That is, despite the new life we have in Christ, despite the wonderful changes in our existence, who doesn't realise his or her own constant need of pardon and forgiveness? Why then is the knowledge of Christ as our High Priest so precious to us? Thursday, May 3, the Day of Atonement. The book of Hebrews teaches that the earthly Hebrew sanctuary service was a model of the heavenly sanctuary, the one that Christ entered and inaugurated as our high priest. The earthly service, with its two apartments and its sacrificial and cleansing rituals, was, as Paul writes in Hebrews 8 verse 5, the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. And, just as the earthly sanctuary ritual included a ministry in the two compartments, the holy place and the most holy place, so also does Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. 
In the earthly sanctuary, the concept of judgment was represented on the Day of Atonement, which resulted in the cleansing of the sanctuary, as depicted in Leviticus chapter 17. This was the one time of a year when the high priest entered into the second apartment, the most holy place, to do a work of cleansing and atonement on behalf of the people, as we read in Leviticus 16, verses 12 to 14. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Question. Read Hebrews chapter 9 verses 20 to 23. What needs to be purified and cleansed, and why is this a clear reference to the Day of Atonement ministry of Christ. Hebrews 9, beginning at verse 20, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Scholars have been surprised by the statement that the heavenly sanctuary itself needed to be cleansed or purified. However, once this is understood as a Day of Atonement reference, the problem vanishes. Hebrews 9.23 shows that the work Christ does in the heavenly sanctuary is the true expression of what the earthly high priest did in the yearly day of atonement service in the Israelite sanctuary. The ministry of the earthly priest in cleansing the earthly sanctuary foreshadowed the work that Christ would do one day in the heavenly. The text does not say that this heavenly cleansing takes place immediately after Christ's ascension. From the study of the book of Daniel, we can see that this phase of ministry began in the year 1844. So, as Christians facing the last days, we need to understand the solemnity of the time that we are in, but rest in the assurance of what Christ has done for us in the past and is doing for us now in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And so to finish today, the first angel's message declares in Revelation 14.7, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. The reality of the judgment points to the nearness of the end. How should this reality impact how we live? Friday, May 4. The book of Hebrews points to the early sanctuary as the model, the type of what Christ would do for us both on earth as our sacrifice and in heaven as our high priest. The Israelite sanctuary was meant always to be an object lesson of the gospel. It was to teach the Jews the plan of salvation, which included sacrifice, intercession, judgment, and the final end of sin. The book of Daniel, meanwhile, adds more light in terms of helping readers to understand the apocalyptic end-time dimensions of Christ's final work in the heavenly sanctuary. From the Handbook of Seventh-day Adventist Theology, published by the Review and Herald Publishing Association in 2000, page 394, we read, With its emphasis on cleansing, judgment and vindication, The apocalyptic visions of Daniel project the imagery of the Day of Atonement to the very end of Earth's history. The cleansing is connected directly to the heavenly sanctuary and to the work of the Messiah as king and priest. The visions introduce the time element, making it possible for the reader to identify a specific moment within salvation history when the Messiah would begin his work of final cleansing, judgment and vindication in the heavenly dwelling of God. 
End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions. One, look at this quote from Ellen G. White, from The Great Controversy, pages 421 and 422. As anciently the sins of the people were by faith placed upon the sin offering and through its blood transferred, in figure, to the earthly sanctuary, so in the new covenant the sins of the repentant are by faith placed upon Christ and transferred, in fact, to the heavenly sanctuary. And, as the typical cleansing of the earthly was accomplished by the removal of the sins by which it had been polluted, so the actual cleansing of the heavenly is to be accomplished by the removal or blotting out of the sins which are there recorded. But, before this can be accomplished, there must be an examination of the books of records to determine who, through repentance of sin and faith in Christ, are entitled to the benefits of his atonement. End of quote. What does she say are the two things that reveal those who are entitled to the benefits of his atonement? Why is it so important for God's people to grasp what these two things are, especially in the trials of the last days? And uh, I guess the answer to that is through repentance of sin and faith in Christ. And question two, read Leviticus chapter 16 verses 15 and 16. What is the significance of the blood? What did the blood represent? Why was the blood so crucial to the Day of Atonement ritual back then? And what does it mean for us today? Leviticus 16, beginning at verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place." because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is by Andrew McChesney, who often writes for Adventist Mission. Irina Metsova doesn't know why she narrowly missed boarding a passenger jet that crashed into the Atlantic Ocean, but the sparing of her life allowed her to share the Sabbath on national television. Irina had planned to fly from New York to her native Czech Republic after a summer of working as a volunteer cook for a group of student literature evangelists, including her college-age son. But the airline, KLM, suspended flights amid an industrial strike and rebooked her on a Swiss Air flight at the last minute. She alerted her sister in the Czech Republic about the change of plans and the sister agreed to meet her at the Prague airport the next day. In the morning, the sister woke up to the news that a Swiss Air DC-10 jet had crashed about two hours after takeoff from New York. It was her sister's plane. In tears, she called Irina's husband. I lost my sister. You lost your wife, she said. But Irina hadn't taken the flight. When Irina approached the Swiss Air desk to check in for flight 111 at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport, the Swiss Air representative said something that changed everything. Mrs. Metzover, you are a Czech, the airline representative said. We can put you on a direct flight from here to the Czech Republic on Czech airlines. How would you like that? Irina liked the idea of not having to change planes in Geneva, and the airline representative printed her a new boarding pass. You have 15 minutes to catch the plane, the airline representative said. Run. At 10.30pm on September 2, 1998, the Swiss Air plane crashed off Canada's coast, killing all 229 people aboard, including a Seventh-day Adventist college student planning to study for a year in France. An in-flight fire was blamed for the tragedy. As the world mourned, Irina's sister learned about the change in the itinerary. Irina, now 68, can't explain what happened. But several years after the tragedy, she was given the opportunity to speak about her faith on Czech national television. On the television program Answered Prayers, 
Irina told about God's goodness amid repressions in communist-era Czechoslovakia. She read the fourth commandment about the Sabbath. Many people heard about the biblical seventh-day Sabbath for the first time, said her son, Kamel Metz, International Coordinator for the Giving Light to Our World, or GLOW, Tracts Ministry. After the program aired, other Adventists told us that their relatives had called them and said, We never knew that the Sabbath was in the Bible, he said. All because Irina somehow missed a flight. Your reader for this week's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide has been Dr. Percy Harold. It has been produced in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind, distributed under the auspices of the Sabbath School Department by HopeChannel.com.